Welcome to the Oregon Humanities Center's 2004-2005 Criticos Lecture in the Humanities. I'm Steve Shankman, Director of the Center. I uh, want to remind you about what the Criticos Professorship is. It was created through a private endowment, which along with matching funds from the State of Oregon and the National Endowment for the Humanities allows us to bring to Oregon each year distinguished scholars, critics, and leaders in the humanities who are known for speaking their minds. We also look for writers who are able to cross the divide between the academic, the academia, and the educated public at large. Am I blowing your ears out with this mic? You're so polite. How's that? <laughs> you want me to start over? Uh, <laughs> tonight's speaker, Louis Menand, does precisely that, that is br uh, bridge this gap. Uh, with elegance, wit, and learning. I want to let you know that if you'd like to offer us feedback on our sound system or on our <laughs> other programs, or, or if you'd like to get on our mailing list, uh, please pick up a, a comment form from a member of our staff in the back. And if you appreciate and enjoy the programs that the Humanities Center offers, uh, which are free and open to the public, uh, and if you want them to continue in the future, please think about making a gift to the center as well. Now, uh, Professor Menand and I were colleagues at Princeton a couple of decades ago. And one of my first memories of Luke was his uh, introducing Stephen Marcus of Columbia's Department of English and Comparative Literature to a Princeton audience before uh, Professor Marcus gave an invited lecture. Stephen Marcus, Luke announced, directed my dissertation at Columbia. Among his other achievements, <laughs> I was immediately struck by Luke's understated and yet bold wit, a boldness and a witty charm that we find coupled with extraordinary deftness in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Metaphysical Club. Louis Menand and I, as I said, were colleagues uh, two decades ago. Among his other achievements, uh, Louis Menand is professor of English and American literature at Harvard University, having taught first at Princeton and CUNY. He earned his BA in creative writing from Pomona College right here on the West Coast before moving to the East Coast to earn his PhD in English from Columbia. He's a staff writer for The New Yorker and a contributor to many other publications. His book, The Metaphysical Club, A Story of Ideas in America, 2001, was a bestseller that won both the Pulitzer Prize for History and the Frank Francis Parkman Prize from the American Association of Historians. I continue to marvel at how our speaker was able to write a bestseller on complex philosophical thinkers like Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., William James, Charles Sanders Peirce, and John Dewey. Humanists in the academy clearly have a lot to learn about writing and how to reach a broader public without sacrificing death and subtlety of thought from Professor Louis Menand. Professor Menand's other books include American Studies 2002, The Future of Academic Freedom 1996, and Discovering Modernism, T.S. Eliot and His Context 1987. Louis Menand is a sharp observer and a learned student of historical trends in higher education in America. Please join me in welcoming Professor Menand, who's going to be speaking to us tonight on the humanities and the university in the 21st century. Thank you, Steve. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's great to see my old friend, Steve Shankman. Uh, it's not so great to be reminded that I said that. Uh, <laughs> I'd totally forgotten about that, but <clears throat> I'm sure there was an Oedipal thing going on uh, there. Um, I, I feel I should say a little bit, uh, a few words that, um, by way of a preface to this talk I'm going to read to you. Um, about 10 years ago, I started being invited to uh, attend and sometimes to participate in conferences often sponsored by humanity centers like the one that Steve directs here um, uh, conferences about the subject of the humanities disciplines and the mood at those conferences was generally one of anxiety um, and uh, 
in various places where I've worked, and including my present job at Harvard, uh, there's a similar anxiety about the fate of the humanities, the social status and institutional status of the humanities, and even some uh, anxiety about uh, self-definition. Uh, so the paper that I'm going to read to you, the talk I'm going to give tonight, is comes out of a lot of experience of people talking about the humanities in a rather dire tone. Um, I make this preparatory remark because not every humanist shares this anxiety and not every institution um, has reason to feel concerned about their humanities departments. Um, and not knowing very much about the University of Oregon's uh, uh, situation, uh, I want to make sure that uh, you understand where I'm coming from when I speak in these uh, heightened uh, tones. So the uh, paper is called "The Humanities in the University of the in the University of the 21st Century," and the idea is to try to give a little sense of where things are and how they got there, and then maybe some ideas about how the humanities might look uh, down the road. I was reading the Science Times section of the New York Times um, a few months ago, and I came across an article on string theory. The article included the following sentences, quote, the, su the suggestion that nature is ultimately composed of tiny strings has led to a revolution in our view of the universe. String theory has led theorists to the idea that space and time are illusions. Nature is like a three-dimensional image on a two-dimensional bank card, a hologram. Physicists hope that in the end, string theory will help explain how this picture of a multi-dimensional reality we call a universe is constructed, end quote. My first thought was that if someone in a French department had said this, the New York Times would have strung her up for ridicule on the front page. And so soon after with the new criterion, the new republic, the New York Review of Books, Commentary, the National Review, the Nation, and Dissent. The New Yorker would have run a thoughtful editorial <laughs> explaining it, although the theory is obviously wacky, we must show respect for all points of view, and that France is a marvelous country. <laughs> it's really a little hard to understand. If you say that the meaning of a poem is indeterminate, you're accused of posing a threat to Western values, often by people who never read poetry. But if you say that the universe is like an ATM card, you get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> How did humanists get painted into a corner such that everything that a social or natural scientist says that is counterintuitive receives public genuflection, but literature professors are expected to, to do nothing but reaffirm common sense? There is sickness, and then there is the sickness of obsessing about your sickness. It's possible to feel that one of the things ailing the humanities today is the amount of time humanists spend talking about things ailing the humanities. I just described I've spent 10 years going to conferences about this very subject. We may be suffering from an excess of internal critiques of our suffering. Still, the internal critiques of the academic humanities departments are a whole lot more informed than the external critiques, which are mostly tendentious and mostly worthless. The profession may have turned its problems into its subject matter, but that's, after all, what we were trained to do. So I'm going to talk this evening about the condition of the humanities in its academic aspect. So there are reasons to believe that the condition of the humanities in their various non-academic aspects is pretty robust, to cite one bit of data. The number of bachelor's degrees awarded every year in English literature since 1990 has dropped by 1%, even though the number of all bachelor's degrees has increased by more than 13%. But the number of bachelor's degrees awarded annually in the visual and performing arts has increased by 45% since 1990. So it's the scholarly side of the humanities that is in trouble. Literature departments are institutionally weak and they're culturally weak. I don't think that literature professors are entirely to blame but I do think that we have developed certain habits that are perpetuating the difficulties. Okay, sorry. Thank you. At the end of the evening, we'll have the absolutely perfect <laughs> sound. <clears throat> so I, as I said, I think we've developed a few habits that are perpetuating some of these difficulties, and I want to talk about 
um, some of the habits, and then I'll tell a story about the emergence of the modern liberal arts college that might offer a way of thinking about the future. First, I think that the profession of uh, literature is getting strangled by a ge greatest generation narrative. The narrative goes something like this. On or about October 1966, the ancien regime all of a sudden died. And for the next 20 years, the giants of anti-foundationalism strode the earth. Their footsteps caused academic halls to tremble as far away as the law school. A lot of people hated the message that was being delivered by these giants. A lot of people resisted the message, but everybody was obliged to confront it. The message reduced to a nutshell was that it's interpretation all the way down. This was alarming news in the Cold War knowledge factory, and it made for exciting times for humanists because interpretation, after all, was their business. They had hit an institutional nerve. Soon the anti-foundationalists were followed by the feminists and the post-colonialists and the multiculturalists. Their impact was more local, but they tore through the canon, they rebuilt the disciplines, and they gave careers to a fresh cohort of disciples. These were all people who got into the business at what turned out to be the peak of student interest in the humanities around 1970. Since 1970, though, it has been downhill. Far fewer students major in the humanities today, and the anti-foundationalist, multiculturalist message has penetrated about as deep as it's going to penetrate. The universe feels smaller. The response from the senior tier of the profession, all of them veterans of the era of the greatest generation, is to propose consolidation, retrenchment, a return to the old verities of reading and writing. Having had their rides on the shoulders of giants, they now advise fresh entrance to the field that, as exciting as it all was, the air was actually a little thin up there. It turned out that literary theory did not set capitalism on its ear. Who would have guessed it? <laughs> there is talk of a return to the literary and to topics like beauty, the very things that the greatest generation rescued us from. Shrunken expectations for a shrunken world. This narrative stifles renewal. Critical inquiry requires young Turks to keep it alive, and it's hard to see many out there on the horizon. There is a post-theory group in the gener younger generation. They bristle with it's an all-over attitude, but people of my generation look at the post-theory people and we recognize them immediately. They're the theory people. <clears throat> Their attitude is not you got it all wrong. Their attitude is stop repeating yourselves. We already know this stuff and probably better than you do. The profession could use some younger people who think that the grown-ups did get it all wrong. Part of the reason for this Turk dearth is the admonitory greatest generation narrative, a paralyzing form of ancestor worship. But part of it has to do with long-term reproductive issues. You can become a lawyer in three years. You, you can become a doctor in four years. In six years, you can have an MD, PhD, but in order to become an assistant professor in a humanities department, the median time to degree is currently 8.9 years. That figure does not include what is called stop time when students take a leave of absence, and it's not measured from receipt of the bachelor's degree. It's 8.9 years as a registered student in a doctoral program. Half of all students who enter humanities PhD programs drop out. These are not necessarily the weakest students. And of those who complete the degree, half do not get jobs the year they graduate. These are serious barriers to entry. There are a lot of historical reasons for the obscene length of time to degree, but you would think that market forces would shake things out. This is just an inefficient use of social resources. In 1970-71, time to degree was four and a half years, about half of what it is today. In that year, 7071, English departments awarded 64,000 bachelor's degrees, which was 7.6% of degrees in every field, including non-liberal arts fields like business. More bachelor's degrees were awarded in English in 1970-71 than in any other liberal arts category except history and social science, which is a category that includes several disciplines. 30 years later, 2000-2001, 
The number of bachelor's degrees awarded in all fields was 50 percent higher than 7071, but only about 4 percent of those degrees were awarded in English. In absolute numbers, the number of undergraduate degrees in English have dropped by a third, but the system is producing the same number of PhDs as it was producing in 1970. These PhDs have trouble getting tenure-track jobs because there are fewer students who major in English, and therefore the demand for English literature specialists has declined. But although students spend less time in literature classes today than they did 20 years ago, the number one subject in higher education, measured by credit hours students devote to it, has remained the same for 30 years, and the number one subject is composition. We produce PhDs in English. We also produce ABDs in English because we need to staff composition courses. The time to degree issue is not a problem only because of the embarrassing labor practices that everybody knows it's associated with. It's also an intellectual problem. The obstacles to professional success are so high at the portal that students are largely self-sorted before they get into the business. They already talk the talk, and their main goal in graduate school is to learn how to talk the talk at conferences. And the obstacles at the other end, the placement and tenure anxieties, do not encourage iconoclasm. Time to degree, job placement, and the tenure rate guarantee a culture of conformity. The profession is not reproducing itself so much as cloning itself. One sign that this is happening is that there appears to be little change in, the disserta in, the, in dissertation topics in the last 10 years. Everybody seems to be writing the same dissertation and with a toolkit that has not altered much since 1990. If it were easier and cheaper to get in and out of the doctoral motel, the discipline would have a chance to get oxygenated by people who were a lot less invested in its paradigms. Faculty in science and some of the social science fields today tend to regard humanists as reflexively oppositional to what they do and therefore as easy people to discount. This perception is founded mainly on ignorance. The summaries of the state of ideas in the humanities in books like E.O. Wilson's Consilience and Steven Pinker's The Blank Slate are appallingly wrong. But the ignorance is depressing since it indicates that humanists have failed at explaining what they do and why the humanities offers as good a return on social investment as genetics or economics. Humanists do feed this perception by reciting predictable critiques of the claims of science and social science. Our response to anything is, it's more complicated than that. They say X, we say, but it's overdetermined. They say Y, we say, but there's a contradiction. They say Z, we say, but the concept is socially constructed or historically contested. Humanities departments have turned into the little boy who cries, difference. Humanities professors are right, there is difference. It is always more complicated. Concepts are constructed. But their role can't be the role of just problematizing this and calling into question that. Humanities professors need to construct alternative paradigms, and those paradigms cannot be built merely from some notion of the literary or of textuality, or they'll blow right over. It's not easy to explain why the humanities are valuable in an academic universe in which first the liberal arts component is shrinking relative to the mass, that is all of liberal arts fields, and second many of the humanities disciplines themselves are undergoing a sort of redefinition, a redefinition that some people find indistinguishable from a de-definition. People often complain that the liberal arts are always being asked to justify themselves on the basis of utility. And this is the wrong stick to measure them with. But let's be realistic. Four years, and at many places, some portion of $100,000 is a lot to spend on an experience with no evident utility, particularly in a world where there are many other choices. Higher education today is a buyer's market. How did the liberal arts get an allergy to the concept of utility? The answer takes us pretty far back in the history of American higher education to a period just after the Civil War. 
Charles William Eliot was made president of Harvard in 1869. The inauguration ceremony was held on October 19, 1869. As the university's historian later put it, quote, few of those present lived to witness another, end quote, because Eliot held the job for 40 years until his retirement in 1909. By then, he had become identified with almost everything that distinguishes the American Research University from the antebellum college the abandonment of the role of in loco parentis, the abolition of required coursework, the introduction of an elective system for undergraduates, the establishment of graduate schools with academic doctoral programs, and the emergence of pure and applied research as major components of the university's mission. In other words, the modern research university. Eliot did play a prominent role in all of these developments. He was, after all, a prominent figure at a prominent school, but he was not their originator. Other colleges instituted many of these reforms well before Harvard did. The reform Eliot was most closely associated with was the elective system. By 1900, he had got rid of virtually all required courses at Harvard, with the result that over half of Harvard graduates took four years worth of nothing but introductory courses. But Cornell had been founded in 1868 as a school where, in the words of its donor, the financier Ezra Cornell, any person can find instruction in any study. And in fact, a system of free electives for undergraduates had been tried even before that at Brown in the 1840s under President Francis Wayland. In fact, before he was appointed president of Harvard, Eliot had actually been somewhat dubious of undergraduate electives. And he seems to have changed his mind when he learned that a committee of the Harvard overseers was already recommending more of them. But Eliot did bring one original and revolutionary idea with him when he came into office. This was to make the bachelor's degree a prerequisite for admission to professional school. This may seem like a minor reform, but it was possibly the key structural element in the transformation of American higher education in the decades after the Civil War. Before Eliot, students entering higher education could choose between college and professional school. In 1869, Eliot's first year as president, half the students at Harvard Law School and nearly three quarters of the students at Harvard Medical School had never attended college. And those were comparatively respectable numbers. In that year, only 19 of 411 medical students at the University of Michigan and zero of 387 law students at Michigan had prior undergraduate degrees. In the 1860s, science was normally studied in schools separate from the college. At Harvard, a school called the Lawrence Scientific School, Chandler Scientific School at Dartmouth, and so on. In terms of preparation, these scientific schools were the worst. Eliot called them the ugly ducklings of American higher education, safe harbors for laziness or stupidity, he said. The Chandler School at Dartmouth was founded in 1851. Students could enter at 14. And by 1868, the school had 104 graduates, none of whom had uh, college degrees. Between 1846 and 1868, only 22 graduates of Harvard's scientific school had undergraduate degrees. The Sheffield Scientific School at Yale had no admissions requirements. There were also no admissions requirements at Harvard Law School when Elliott became president except for evidence of good character and the ability to pay $100 tuition, which went into the pockets of the law professors. There were no grades or exams at Harvard Law School in 1869 either. Students often left before the end of the two-year curriculum to go to work, but they received their degree anyway. The novelist Henry James enrolled at Harvard Law School in 1861. Nobody knows why. He was 19 years old. He had had no college education and only sporadic secondary education, all of it in Europe. He attended lectures faithfully, although attendance was not mandatory at Harvard Law School. He learned nothing. He spent most of his spare time reading Sainte Beuve. After a year, he quietly departed. <laughs> Charles William Eliot considered the state of affairs scandalous. He'd published an article about it in the Atlantic Monthly just a few months before being offered the presidency in 1869. And once in office, he immediately set about instituting admissions and graduation requirements at Harvard schools of medicine, law, divinity, and science and forcing them to develop meaningful criteria. And this actually caused uh, enrollments to shrink 
uh, in the short term because students realize they'd actually be expected to work for their degrees. It took a long time for Elliott's reform to be adopted. That is for a bachelor's degree to be a prerequisite to go to professional school. You could go to Harvard Medical School without a BA until 1901. But once the reform was widely adopted, it had several long-term effects on American education and on American society. First of all, it professionalized the professions. Because it put hurdles in front of what had formerly been a pretty smooth path compelling future doctors and lawyers to commit four years of liberal arts education before they entered what are essentially certification programs. This made the professions more selective, and it thereby raised the social status of law, medicine, and science. Law students were no longer teenagers looking for a shortcut to a comfortable career. They were college graduates. They'd been required to demonstrate that they had acquired certain kinds of knowledge. And people who couldn't clear that hurdle couldn't advance to practice. So Elliott's reform helped to put universities in the exclusive business of credentialing professionals. The emergence of pure research as part of the university's mission, the notion that professors should be paid to produce work with no necessary practical application, was the 19th century development Elliott had the least enthusiasm for. He believed in the importance of undergraduate education, as a champion of electives, he always insisted that the subject was less important than the teacher, and he believed in the social value of elite professional schools. He also believed that universities needed to offer some sort of advanced instruction to people who had already graduated from college, but he was too committed to the doctrine of laissez-faire to believe in research whose worth could not be measured in the marketplace. As a consequence, Harvard did not formally establish a graduate school until 1890, which is rather late in the history of graduate education. Still, as Elliot realized once he was committed to them, graduate schools are no different institutionally from professional schools. Doctoral programs professionalized the professoriate. The standards for scholarship, like the standards for law and medicine, became systematized once there were graduate schools. Everybody had to clear the same hurdles to get the PhD. People who could not clear the hurdles or people who never joined the race were pushed to the margins of their fields. Unlike their academic counterparts, these independent scholars were not economically protected and they were therefore compelled to make a living by what could now be condescended to as popularizing. The late 19th century university was really, to adopt a late 20th century term, it really already was a multiversity. It had far less coherence than the old college, since it was essentially a conglomeration of non-overlapping specialties. It altered the intellectual culture, and not every organism proved able to adapt. But Eliot's reform saved the liberal arts college from drowning. By making college the gateway to the professions, Eliot not only linked the college to the rising fortunes of this new class, he enabled it to preserve its anti-utilitarian ethos in an increasingly secular and utilitarian age because Eliot insisted on keeping liberal arts education separate from vocational education. He thought utility should be stressed everywhere in the professional schools but nowhere in the college. He explained in an article in the Atlantic Monthly, quote, the practical spirit and the literary or scholastic spirit are both good, but they are incompatible. If commingled, they are both spoiled." End quote. College for Eliot was about knowledge for its own sake, hence the free elective system, which allowed students to roam intellectually across the curriculum without being shackled to the requirements of a concentration. There were no majors at Harvard when Eliot was president. Liberalization, what the liberal arts experience is about, is the prerequisite for professionalization and specialization, which is what law school, medical school, and so on are about. And that has been the pattern in American education ever since. The question was, was Eliot's segregation of the liberal arts college from the professional schools a dangerous isolation? Because it erected a wall between the liberal arts and the professions. It gave the college its allergy to the term vocationalism. Of course, there is some hypocrisy in this system because there is one vocation for which a liberal arts education is useful, the vocation of being a professor. 
When Eliot retired, one of the first reforms undertaken by his successor, his name was A. Lawrence Lowell, was the institution of the undergraduate major. And ever since, the undergraduate curriculum has been dominated by this institution. But the major is essentially a preparation for graduate work in the field. That is, it's set up in such a way that the students who receive the top marks are those most likely to enter graduate school and become professors themselves. Still, in every other respect, Eliot erected a firewall between the college and the world of the professions. So one question we might ask is whether that firewall is still sustainable and still desirable. The danger that seems to confront the liberal arts and the humanities in particular today is the same as the danger that seemed to confront them in Charles Eliot's day. That's that they will be marginalized by the proliferation and attraction of non-liberal educational alternatives. And there's empirical support for this anxiety. A college is classified by the Carnegie classification as a liberal arts institution if it war awards at least half of its degrees in the liberal arts fields. Most of the roughly 4,000 institutions of higher education in the United States do not attain this level. Even in the leading research universities, what used to be called Research One in the Carnegie classification, it's now called Doctoral Research Extensive, even in those leading research universities, only about half the bachelor's degrees are awarded in liberal arts fields. The biggest undergraduate major by far in the United States is business. 20% of all bachelor's degrees are awarded in business. 10% are awarded in education. 7% are awarded in the health professions. There are almost twice as many undergraduate degrees conferred every year in social work as in all foreign languages and literatures combined. This is not a sudden development. The proportion of undergraduate degrees awarded annually in the liberal arts has been dropping for 100 years, apart from a brief rise between 1955 and 1970, thanks to the Cold War, the baby boom, and the student deferment from the military draft. Except for that decade and a half, between 55 and 1970, the general rule is that the more American higher education expands, the more people go to college, the more the liberal arts sector shrinks in proportion to the whole. Half of all Americans now have some exposure to college in the course of their lives, a fantastic number compared to the rest of the world. And only about 35% of those have anything that would count as a liberal arts education. For most Americans, the word college does not connote the liberal arts. The instinctive response has been to draw up the, the drawbridge, to preserve our virginity at any price. But maybe chastity is part of what's killing us. Maybe we can get a little bit pregnant and respect ourselves in the morning. Uh, look at it this way. What are the liberal arts? They're simply fields in which knowledge is pursued disinterestedly for its own sake. Almost any of those fields can be made non-liberal by turning it in the direction of some practical skill. English departments can have writing programs, even publishing programs. Pure mathematics becomes applied mathematics and en even engineering. Sociology shades into social work. Biology shades into medicine and so on. But conversely, just as importantly, any practical field, any professional field can be made liberal simply by teaching it historically or theoretically. There's resistance, for example, in many economics departments and liberal arts colleges to teaching accounting, despite considerable student demand for accounting courses, because it's felt that accounting is vocational, not a liberal art. We must always remember the immortal dictum, garbage is garbage, but the history of garbage is scholarship. <laughs> accounting is a vocation, but the history of accounting is a subject of disinterested inquiry, a liberal art. In all the talk about interdisciplinarity that's sweeping higher education, this is the interdisciplinarity that will matter. When it is seen that future lawyers can benefit from learning about the philosophical aspects of the law, just as literature majors learn more about poetry by writing poems. This gives us a clue to the value-added potential of liberal education. As we all know, because it's what we all teach, historical and theoretical knowledge exposes the contingency of present arrangements. It unearths the a prioris buried under present assumptions. It shows us the man behind the curtain, 
provides us a glimpse of what's outside the box. We know this. Sometimes we draw the wrong inference. We think that showing the man behind the curtain subverts the spectacle, that it makes students stop and question, and we stop there. But revealing contingency and constructedness does not end the spectacle. The spectacle goes on. The student who now knows enough to suspect that there's always a man behind the curtain, that it's a human world all the way through, who knows that arrangements are always produced historically rather than naturally, that our priorities lurk in every discourse, that they're outsides of every box. The student who knows that is thereby not merely a better literary critic, he or she is a better actor in the world. That understanding gives students an edge in life. And the purpose of education, whether it's vocational or academic, is empowerment. It's all about making people confident enough and competent enough to take charge of their own lives. Disinterestedness is perfectly compatible with this practical ambition, and practical ambitions are perfectly consistent with disinterestedness. Maybe we should stop letting the professional schools monopolize teaching in law, health, education, business, architecture, public policy, social service, and technology. Maybe we should also stop fretting about the meaning of the liberal arts and just teach whatever we think is useful for people to know. A lot of this anxiety about connecting liberal arts and the humanities to the world of practice is being displaced onto the disciplines themselves. Those seem to many people to be what's standing in the way of giving knowledge a boost. The problem isn't ourselves, uh, it's our departments. <laughs> Traditionally, an academic discipline was a paradigm inhabiting an institutional structure. Anthropology, or English, was both the name of an academic department and a discrete, largely autonomous program of inquiry. 30, 40, 30 or 40 years ago, if you asked a dozen anthropology professors what anthropology's program of inquiry was, what anthropology professors did that distinguished them from sociology professors and literature professors and history professors, you might have gotten different answers, possibly even some contradictory answers, because all academic fields have rival schools, but by and large the professors would have had fairly specific definitions of their discipline. They would have had little trouble filling in the blank in the sentence, anthropology is blank. Today, you would be likely to get two types of definition, neither one terribly specific or terribly useful. One definition is, anthropology is the study of its own assumptions. This might be called the critical definition. The other definition is, anthropology is whatever people in anthropology departments do. This could be called the pragmatic definition. Not every liberal arts discipline is in this condition, of course. I think English is in that condition, for example, but philosophy is not. And that only heightens the sense of confusion. It tends to set people in fields in which identification with a paradigm remains fairly tight, like philosophy, against people in fields in which anything goes, like English. Philosophy professors, to caricature it slightly, Philosophy professors tend to think that work done by English professors lacks rigor. English professors t tend to think that the work of philosophy professors is narrow and unselfcritical. The dissociation of academic work from traditional departments has become so expected in the humanities in particular that it's a common topic of conferences and jokes. Uh, I was at a conference at the Stanford Humanities Center a few years ago. The conference, of course, was called Have the Humanistic Disciplines Collapsed? Um, and at the conference, one of the directors of the center read to us the titles of projects that were submitted by people applying for fellowships to work there. And she asked the audience to guess, on the basis of the title of the project, which field the applicant was from. The only time the audience was right was when they guessed that an applicant whose project was about politics must be from an English department. <laughs> the situation feels uncomfortable because the university has a kind of allergy to combining subject matter, unless it's done under the rubric of interdisciplinarity, and this always involves noisy administrative fanfare and self-congratulation. Uh, interdisciplinarity is a bee with a fair amount of buzz in it these days. Graduate students applying for a junior position in a humanities discipline 
often go to great lengths in their letters of application to assure the search committee that their work is actually interdisciplinary. Uh, the discipline doesn't take you seriously unless you draw attention to the factitiousness of the discipline. Humanists keep saying that they want more interdisciplinarity, and they're right. Interdisciplinarity is good. But it is, after all, only a ratification of disciplinarity. It's premised precisely on the belief that the disciplines represent discrete programs of inquiry, and there's nothing remotely transgressive about it. You get a psychologist and a music professor, or a sociologist and a literature professor in the same classroom, and the mere meeting of the twain accounts for a lot of the thrill. I had a friend who, a long time ago, used to tell a story about his kids. The kids got up early, little kids got up early every Saturday morning to watch their two favorite shows on television. These were Mr. Rogers and Captain Kangaroo. And one morning, the kids came running into their parents' bedroom with huge excitement. Daddy, Daddy, they cried. Mr. Rogers is on Captain Kangaroo. <laughs> That's interdisciplinarity. <laughs> What humanities departments should want is not just interdisciplinarity or postdisciplinarity. They should definitely not watch or not want consilience, which is a bargain with the devil. What they need to do is to colonize the fields whose subject matter they covet and to bring them into their own realm. To the extent that programs, and particularly graduate programs, consist of a guided tour of the Norton Anthology, as it does in my department. Literature programs are perpetuating their isolation. Why aren't all literature majors required to take a course on the sociology of literature, or a course in literature and philosophy, or literature and science? Why do students of literature have to take their history courses in the history department, when literature departments could offer them history for literature students? This seems a minor curricular point, but it goes to the fear academics have that their field will be dumbed down if they stray from their traditional disciplinary definitions. But it's the definitions themselves that are dumbing us down. Interdisciplinarity begins at home. The humanities is the study of life in its cultural dimension, which happens to be the dimension in which everybody actually lives. You can study human life in its biological and, it, and, it's, and, it, and in its social scientific dimensions. That's, that is, you can look at the genetic causes of behavior, or at the methods by which individuals calculate their political and economic interests, only if you hold culture constant. Culture is not an add-on to the biological and sociological conditions of existence. It is constitutive of species identity. Human beings produce culture in the same sense that they produce carbon dioxide. They can't help it. Culture is the medium in which we act. And it is, from a purely rational point of view, always a distorting medium. Culture is why paradigms of social and scientific theory don't work, why people tend never to do what social theory predicts they should do. Immanuel Kant once said that humanity is a crooked timber from which nothing straight can be cut. That's what humanists study. We study the warp. I, uh, attended a conference uh, as an observer last fall uh, concerning the presidential election. And the conference was a conference of professional pollsters, people who work for the two presidential campaigns and for the networks, and political scientists, academics, professors of political science. And they went over the polling data to try to explain what happened in the election. After the uh, presentations were over, I spoke to one of the pollsters who had worked for the Kerry campaign, and I asked him whether he and his colleagues who worked for campaigns were interested in what the political scientists were doing, whether they followed the academic literature in their own field. And he said, no, basically they were not interested in it. He said, because political scientists are interested in the mean, and we want to know what motivates people at the margins. Political scientists try to understand the average voter. He said, we're interested, the, the pollsters for campaigns are interested in the outliers. What's going to motivate them to vote for our candidate? This seems like a plausible description of the difference between the scientists, including many social scientists and humanists. Humanists are interested in the outliers. We're not interested in the mean. We're interested in deviations from the mean. That's where, in the total picture of human activity, the cultural products that we tend to study lie. 
we're looking at a different place on the curve. We don't ask ourselves why, given the existence of the mean, there are these deviant positions. We ask why, given the demonstrated possibility of these deviant positions, the mean is where it is. We therefore find the average less inevitable, less predicted, less natural than we think the scientists do. So we resist the suggestion that the average represents a norm. The version of the humanities that would make some non-humanists more comfortable today is the version in which art and literature are ornaments on or neat illustrations of empirical accounts of human life. But art and literature are not epiphenomenal to the rest of human behavior. Art and literature have cognitive value. They are themselves accounts of human life. A painting or a novel is a report on experience. There's a huge temptation, which is heavily reinforced by the culture, to universalize these reports, to imagine them as uniquely valid accounts of some permanent human nature. I think this position is on the road to ornamentalism. A 19th century novel is a report on the 19th century. It's not a self-help manual for life out here on the 21st century street. But a 19th century novel belongs to the record of human possibility. And developing tools for understanding the 19th century novel, we're at the same time developing tools for understanding ourselves. These tools are part of the substance of humanistic knowledge. They are part of what humanists know. And as they apply to our understanding of novels, they apply to our understanding of everything in the realm of human values. That understanding leads humanists very naturally to be skeptical of claims to transparency or objectivity or value neutrality. Not because they think that those ideals are not worthwhile, but because they're alive to the fact of situatedness, to use a more loaded term, ethnocentrism. And they're alive to the risks of self-deception. Skepticism about empirical forms of knowledge is itself a form of knowledge. Empirical knowledge is worth nothing without it. To the extent that humanists are infiltrating other fields of inquiry, they should keep on infiltrating, and they should take no hostages. In suggesting that the humanities and the liberal arts generally might demonstrate a little less implicitly their relevance to life outside the university, I'm not proposing a turn to, the, to publicness. After September 11th, it appeared as though the culture wars might be over, but obviously that was wishful thinking. It's tempting to say that the culture wars are now back the second time as farce, but it, they were pretty farcical the first time. Still, in the 1980s, the culture wars gave humanists a bracing sense of embattled identity. And today, a certain nostalgia for those times can almost be felt. It's a little like what Samuel Beckett said when he was asked what the afterlife would be like. He said, in the afterlife, we'll sit around talking about the good old days when we wished that we were dead. <laughs> Hostility is better than neglect. At least somebody was paying attention. There's no question that the culture wars of the 1980s damaged the public reputation of the academic humanities. The attacks from the right were predictable enough, part of the price of change. But academic humanists also alienated liberal writers and intellectuals outside the academy. The sneering obituary of Jacques Derrida in the New York Times last year was a rather shocking reminder of the ressentiment that is out there. One response to this hostility in the press and in the public, the press serves, has been a call for more public intellectuals, academics who can write for a general audience. If we could just explain clearly enough what we're doing, then people outside the academy and the public would understand and appreciate it. It's a question of communication. This argument seems to me to be mistaken. People know perfectly well what academic humanists were, are saying. The reason they aren't hearing it is because they don't want to hear it. Saying things more clearly is not going to help. The last premise academic humanists should be accepting is the premise that the value of their views is measured by their correspondence to the views of common sense and the common culture. Being an intellectual and thinking theoretically just is thinking outside the parameters of the common culture and common sense, whether it's string theory or deconstruction. What Derrida believed about language is not what the average newspaper reporter believes about language. Why is that a scandal? What are philosophers for? For that matter, what are universities for? It cannot be that universities exist to flatter the public's self-image. 
That work of flattery is being carried on by powers a million times greater than ours all the time. Intellectual culture is in danger of being dominated by a blind faith in two things. One is the idea that human behavior is ultimately understandable in biological terms, and the other is the vocabulary of classical economic theory. The reason these paradigms exert such a powerful appeal is that they appear to provide all the tools necessary for the prediction and control of the human world and to transcend the limits of ethnocentrism. Criticisms of ethnocentrism or ethnocentrism are precisely what humanists are offering, and that is why no one wants to listen to them. What Americans want to hear from humanists is the cultural past read as a ratification for the political present. It's true that self-justification and self-deception are just part of human life. You can never be entirely rid of them. But there does seem to be an unusual amount of self-justification and self-deception around these days in forms that are a danger to others as well as to ourselves. Ignorance has almost become an entitlement. We're living in a country in which liberals would rather move to the right than offend the superstitions of the uneducated. As always, the invitation to academics is to assist in the construction of the intellectual armature of the status quo. This is an invitation we should decline without regrets. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer some questions. Toward the beginning of the talk, you talked about uh, the decline of the sort of high point of uh, student humanities in the 70s and the decline thereafter. Uh, and you didn't really do anything about cause and effect. Do you feel that, in any sense, the, the giants of the Reconstruction? Well, it's, it's, it's a little hard to account for this. The, the um, question was about the, um, uh, the sort of graph of student interest in the humanities measured by the number of majors uh, in humanities fields. And that did peak in the, around 1970. Um, and that is a finding that's been borne out by many different ways of studying it. And I think the explanation is fairly complicated. Um, but I do think that part of it has to do with the um, change in the economic expectations and anxieties of undergraduates. I think in the 50s and 60s, uh, college students tended to have a more optimistic sense of possibilities and therefore were tend to be a little bit greater risk takers uh, than students after 1970. Remember that the 70s was a period of great economic uh, adjustment in the United States. There was the Nixon recession, and then there of course, the oil problem and so forth. So and in general, um, uh, fears about careers became uh, very prominent. And all of us who have been in the business for that, over that period of time have seen the change in student attitude that's happened. So I think part of it is, is that external factor. The question was whether the rise of what I call the giants of anti-foundationalism uh, was part of it. I think it was part of it, and my own position, my own feeling about it is that that should have been a moment of enormous energy and renewal, and for many people in the humanities it was. I think it was an exciting time. Um, I, I, this is not something I was particularly part of myself, but it was an exciting time for many people I know in the field because they were taking the news to the law department, law schools and to uh, uh, social science departments and so forth about uh, what the what the critical theory had to offer, and people had to debate that, and it was a, sort of a big thing. I think that a combination of... Um, a sense of um, um, making this uh, uh, critical theory subject matter, which in my view was already happening in the culture outside the academy uh, and all other kinds of other areas in painting and architecture and movie criticism and so forth. By making it very esoteric, I think that it did tend to drive some students uh, away from the field. And I think it also got really, really, really bad press uh, and continues to get really bad press. And that's part of what's caused, uh, what's caused the squeeze. But uh, my, 
My guess is if one could study it, I think one would find that the economic shifts have a lot to do with it. Students are looking for a career um, when they get to college and they, and they want to uh, pretty quickly get on a track to one. Sir. You mentioned anthropology and English as being um, wracked with self-doubt or um, self-critique and philosophy completely free of that. I, why is that? Do you have any sense of why are certain disciplines so coming apart at the seams and others seem so yeah, popular? It's, uh, I, I think that it's an, it's an interesting phenomenon. and. When I was a graduate student, um, which was in the 1970s, um, <clears throat> I went to Columbia, which has a great sociology department. And at Columbia, all the people in anthropology were feeling this great sociology envy because sociology knew what it was about. It had theory. Um, it had tools. And anthropology was kind of not sure about where it was. And what happened in a, in a funny way is that their status got reversed. Um, and Part of the reason is that anthropology sort of suddenly went soft. You know, it got interested in these, in these continental theorists, and it began opening up its d definition of what would count as anthropological work to any kind of social arrangement at all. They kind of, what they did was they just poached on sociology, and it just became a much more exciting field for people. Whereas sociology went hard, it got much more quantitative, and it suddenly became you know, for students outside of it just became less relevant and less interesting. So that was a good thing, I think, in that area for anthropology and not, not such a good thing for sociology. Um, but why it couldn't have happened the other way, I don't know. It could certainly have gone the other way, but I think anthropology was looking for uh, something to, you know, give it a life and it found something in that. Um, the philosophy thing is very puzzling to me because I um, I wrote uh, this, the book that Steve mentioned I wrote is on 19th century philosophy and on the philosophy of pragmatism, which never, after about 1920, had really any purchase in American philosophy departments, which went analytic. And going analytic, they uh, cut out mo most pragmatist philosophers, except for a little study of Dewey, um, and um, uh, all continental philosophy. And they have been, until recently, pretty rigid about maintaining that definition. Um, I have a student uh, at Harvard who's switching out of the philosophy department because she really wants to you know, do Kierkegaard. And the best place for her to do it is in the English department. Um, so we were happy to admit her. She's brilliant, but she can't, she can't work in that department. So I, you know, a lot of it just has to do with the traditions of the discipline and it has to do with certain accidental things that happen to it. But, um, I think that uh, it, it, it's part of what creates the confusion in the liberal arts is that there are some of these anything goes fields and there are some of these fields where people feel very uh, protective of their self-definition. I guess in the back. I think, I think uh, institutions are putting more investment in those areas. They're hiring more people. They're creating more new programs. It's an exciting thing. Uh, it's related to the real world, and uh, students want to do it. So, uh, I, but I think a lot of it comes from the, if you, if you invest in that area and you create job, you know, positions for people to teach them and you create majors, you're going to get, you're going to attract students. Um, you know, you gotta, remember the entertainment industry is the second largest exporter to the United States in terms of dollars to aerospace, which is number one. Um, and so people, it's a great profession, it's a great industry, and people want to get into it, and it's a good, I think it's terrific that colleges are, are part of how people get trained to do that. But I think that's part of the explanation. Yes, sir. Yeah, could you address the cost of education? Now, it seems like that has a big factor in, uh, you know, people are going to go there and they want to get, to come out of there and be able to make some money instead of come out of there and be, you know, totally in debt and not have any uh, prospect for the job. So. Yeah, it's, a, it's very expensive at the top tiers. And, uh, and it, of course, the top tiers are very competitive because those degrees seem like tickets to, uh, to, the, to careers. And um, I don't know what the average tuition now is at the top schools, but I think the cost of going to Harvard every year is $45,000. Now, Harvard can afford to make that possible for the people it admits, but not all of these institutions can do that. Um, the, but it's a complicated situation because there are many cheap ways to get a great education in the United States. I don't know what the situation here at uh, Oregon is, but um, 
you know, obviously, if you go to if you go to a state, there are many great state universities where it's a lot cheaper than it is to go to an Ivy League school. So I think there's many ways to get a good to get a good education. I do think, though, again, going back to the first question, that um, students are far more aware of the cost of education and far more concerned about being able to pay it back or to or to turn that investment into a decent income when they get out of college than they were 30 and. 40 years ago, and that that's part of what's created a slightly different culture uh, for liberal arts students. Yes, sir. I noticed in your talk that you didn't mention the rise of religious fundamentalism, and that seems to me to be... I would say this is the first talk that's probably been given in the last three years that hasn't mentioned the rise of religious fundamentalism. <laughs> to the uh, diminishment of the humanities, because if one of the things the humanities talk about that the social sciences and the natural sciences don't, it's, it's in terms of value. Yeah. Right, wrong, good, evil, aesthetic value. And it seems as if right there's no cultural space for that to be deliberated, yeah. at least for large sections of the population who think those questions are set. So I'm wondering the degree to which, I mean, we could lay that, wh where's that rise happening? I sort of think, I associate this at least with Reagan, right, in the beginning of Forrest Gump style politics yeah. and the like. Yeah. But it seems to me there's at least 25 years of hostility towards humanistic reflection because that undermines what for many people are right, unquestionable sources of value. Yeah, I, I, that's an excellent point, and uh, I should have mentioned it. Um, uh, because um, I, I think that is does go to a lot of where the issues are. That's I, The little thing I mentioned at the end about ignorance being an entitlement is a little, was meant to gesture towards that. It's just, and, and you know, I, I see this attitude from, you know, from people who are not religious at all and very well educated people uh, in the, in the you know journalistic world um, whom I know it there are certain verities that you're not supposed to to question there there's a certain level of nuance that you're that you're simply not supposed to get to um, and my my own f fear which I suggested at the end is that a lot of humanists are kind of buying into that and well, really what it's all about is, con is affirming, you know, these values which are traditional and part of our culture and so forth and so on. Well, I, I just don't think that is our job, uh, first of all. Uh, and then second of all, th those values are being confirmed in the worst ways, right, out there in the public sphere and the political sphere um, and the religious areas. And so it's, it's kind of we have a job to do, and part of our job is to just continue to be skeptical, even if people don't like to hear it and people don't like to hear it. But that, you're certainly right. I think that's definitely part of what's going on right now. And that's the scary part of it because there's real political muscle in it. Sir? And perhaps a related question, I mean, how do uh, humanists engage in public debate like the one currently going on in Kansas, I mean, mm -hmm. Stokes trial redux, yeah. um, when we're excluded from uh, congressional hearings and things yeah. like that? I mean, how do we engage such an issue? We don't have access, yeah. We don't, because we're not wanted on those things. Um, and. Uh, I mean, to that extent, yeah, we need to be able to communicate and we need to be able to um, be visible in those debates outside the university. But, um, but I think we're not wanted and the voice isn't wanted. Um, but I don't think that means we should give up um, expressing skepticism about what goes on. It is hard. Yes, sir. Um, well, if the public doesn't want to listen to the public intellectual, just to build on this question, uh, what do you do in a public university where you're so uh, dependent on um, you know, public financing, not just from the legislators, but increasingly as they're uh, giving less and less to support uh, public universities to, um, you know, uh, large donors and others. So it's 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 a um, it, it's a real um, it's a real dilemma. It is a real dilemma. I worked for 15 years at City University of New York, which is a public institution, and. Uh, um, and which is very much a political football between the city and the state. Um, New York is a place in which uh, everything that's a problem, the city tries to make the state's problem, and the state tries to make the city's problem. So uh, if you're a city university, it's just like the worst place to be. Um, but I think that the, the only noble or honorable argument to make is to say that we're valuable to you because we do our own thing. Uh, and uh, this is something that society has bargained for and that, and that it needs. And you, that is, the legislators or the mayor or the governor, or whoever the public officials are, 
uh, have to be able to say um, that uh, to the public when, when issues arise about um, things that professors study or things that professors say, that uh, they have to be able to say that this is uh, something of public value uh, for what it is. Um, and I think that historically the public has bought that. Um, you know, there's no law that protects academic freedom. I mean, in a public university, we're protected by the First Amendment, but in the principle of academic freedom is just an invention of John Dewey and uh, Arthur Lovejoy. And, um, and the only uh, group that has any uh, uh, power to, to protect that is the AUP, which has no power, really, except to censor uh, colleges and universities. But I think that the public does recognize that academic freedom is a valid value, even though it's not in the Constitution and it doesn't have legal standing. Um, and that, that there is something important about allowing uh, people to talk about the issues that we talk about. If string theorists can say the world is two-dimensional and we're making up you know, time and space, I don't see why we can't say almost anything. I mean, it's just part, it's just, it's just part of thinking, right? It's just part of what evol involves, what's involved in, in thinking uh, about things uh, theoretically. So, um, but that's not a very good answer because the pressures are real and they recur. I mean, Colorado just went through this thing um, and, and they come up all the time. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, the, 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 the real danger of the discrediting of the academic discourse by the right wing in the last 20 years has been that this, this contract will, will be lapsed, that people won't respect it anymore, and that it will be, it will be ugly. Sir, in the back. Uh, I was wondering if you could say more clearly what it is you're saying about the condition of the humanities. It seems to me I'm, I came in a little late, so I'm not clear. Are you saying it's in terrible condition, uh, or, or what? <laughs> Yeah, I think, that, I think that there are two problems. One problem is external, one problem is internal. The external problem is that it has to do with student interest and enrollment. It has to do with um, the kind of a public uh, image of the humanities that's created by um, critiques of people from outside who don't understand it or who, who think it's too multicultural, politically correct or whatever. Um, and... Uh, economic pressures on the liberal arts colleges. Also, those are all sort of outside things. And the inside problems, I think, are, I think that the, uh, some disciplines, and certainly my discipline, English, I think, uh, need to open themselves up to new kinds of students and new ideas and new points of view. And they're having difficulty doing that because, A, I think they're trapped in a narrative about what the discipline means and what's really important in it that's become an anomaly, and B, because the system of doctoral education is, tends to be cloning itself rather than reproducing itself in interesting ways. So in general, I would like to see um, a more relaxed and easier entry into the academic profession so that people can get into it without feeling they're committing their lives to it or they're going to be in a tunnel that you know, is dark for 10 years before they get out so that they can try it and get a degree and if they don't want to teach or they're not interested in it, can go off and do something else, but not so that the people who get into it are so self-selected that they can't think in any other way. And that that will help oxygenate what we do. And I, I don't know what the new ideas would be, but I think it would be great if they were around and could be contested, and that's part of what makes a field of study live. So it's, there's hope. <laughs> but those are my two uh, diagnoses. Yes, ma'am. I'm an English student, and I felt like a lot of the uh, problems that you mentioned are things that I face as an undergraduate, but I'm wondering how undergraduates now are supposed to help open up our disciplines in the future if we want to try that. So do you have any ideas? <laughs> You're my idea, you know. Um, I think that um, uh, one thing that's always good in... Uh, in the university is just cross-pollination from discipline to discipline, and those things do happen. And um, so one thing that undergraduates bring with them when they come into the English department classroom is an interest in other subjects that they're taking that they can see connections with in English. And that's, I think, always a fruitful way to get involved with a new uh, field. I don't know what how your English department works here, and um, 
I don't know how sort of traditionally literary it is or how interdisciplinary it is, but I think the, the general feel about interdisciplinary, I think interdisciplinarity is a good one, which is that it does need this sense of um, back and forth among uh, different fields. Um, and the only other thing is that there's no reason to be in a field like English literature if you're not doing with it what you want to do with it. I mean, that's what the great attraction of it was for me, and I think for most people who have gotten into it. It just was an area where you're really interested in these books. You really find all kinds of things that they inspire you to think about and to write about, and that's why you do it. And if, to the extent that you feel that you're being told this isn't appropriate, this doesn't count, this isn't criticism, that's not good, and you should fight with that because that's part of what keeps something alive again is that people feeling this is, they're doing it from passion. Yes, sir. Um, from what uh, you were saying just now, also as a liberal, liberal arts undergrad, um, there was this great lockstep that we're forced to deal with. I am a journalism major, English major, I'm a comp lit major, and because there is no box that we can fit ourselves into, but as such, there's this great lockstep that if we were interested in grad school, we have to catapult ourselves and our ideas out there, but if they do not fit into this dissertation, this that you mentioned earlier that is apparently everyone's, then <laughs> we're kind of stuck because we're not perpetuating the status quo, and yet if we have something divergent, then we're going to be shot down for, for doing just that. Yeah, um, yeah the, the, you're describing a certain pressure of conformity that's not, you know, that's not good for the business. Um, Again, you know, I, I think um, this sounds very Pollyannish, but um, I think that it, if you're interested in thinking and in writing, um, generally, if you stick to what you want to do, you know, you'll find an opening for yourself somewhere. And uh, it's just. This, I've been trying to describe this in various different ways. There's a fear that if you don't play by some rules that you imagine you're supposed to play by, that you'll, you'll fall off the edge of the abyss. That's not true. There isn't any abyss. There's just life out there. And you want to you wanna just, you want to do with the things that you care about if you believe in them. And um, it sounds like a movie now, but... Uh, <laughs> but but that, but what's 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 preventing things from I think what's what's making people feel more and more nervous is their nervousness. You know, I mean, the only thing we have to be nervous about is nervousness itself, and um, be, because it's preventing us from from trying things, um, and it, and we're not. It's not lightning is not going to strike us. You know, if we get it wrong, and we can try it again. Sir, uh, most of your talk is focused on the humanities in this country. Uh, I'm wondering if there's any lessons to be learned or any experiences you might have or know about of the humanities in other countries that would be relevant to how we can revive ourselves. Or, you know, I, it's a good question. I don't honestly have uh, anything very specific to say about that. Um, I do think that uh, comparative um, analysis of higher education is a little problematic because other countries are just so different in what they use college and higher education for. American higher education is unique and it's almost like mass education here. 50% uh, of Americans go to have some experience of college. In England, 17% have some experience of college. It's just, it, it, it's, just con it's just conceived of as a very different kind of thing. So it's still a good question and specifically having to do with the humanities, and I don't really have a very good answer for that, but I think that here it, we're talking about large numbers of people, only a tiny fraction of whom are going to be specialists in the subjects that we're teaching. Uh, most of these people are in college and they're going to go off and do something completely non-academic, and that's generally not true in other countries. Sir? The last question is about 12 20 for... <laughs> <laughs> well, in regards to uh, intellectual skills like starting out with uh, a priori assumptions. You seem to be saying that, that uh, undergraduate liberal arts education would be superior to the, the experience you would have in a vocational education or just being self-taught. Self Why do you think that's true? I think, it's a, I think it's, it makes you, I think that the ability to think that way helps you in any situation uh, later in life where you have to use your brain. 
And I think because uh, one thing that um, liberal arts helps people to internalize is by virtue of its historical perspective on most subjects, is to internalize the non-naturalness of most current arrangements. The, the normal thing is to assume that the world as we face it is the world as it would naturally be. And what history helps you understand is that it could have come out many different ways and it could be different from the way it is now. That's an advantage in any conversation you're having with somebody who doesn't sort of get that there's a backstory to where we are now. And secondly, um, uh, liberal arts do help you to think in philosophical or theoretical terms about what you're discussing. And I'll give a personal example, um, uh, which, because it's personal and anecdotal, is obviously not uh, determinative. Um, when, I, when I left college, um, I, I was an English major uh, with an emphasis in creative writing, and uh, I went to law school. And I really had, didn't have very much um, background in the law or in political philosophy or really very much in political science because uh, I'd really been writing poetry. Um, and uh, in law school, um, the law school I went to used the case method in a very traditional form, which meant that you read judicial opinions and then in class you argue uh, the reasoning of those opinions. And the teacher states hypothetical variations on the case that you read and then you try to figure out how far the uh, the principle will extend to those hypothetical cases. And I had no idea why we were doing this. And I didn't have any idea why we were doing it because I had no idea of what the philosophical background of the p different positions you could take in a particular case might be. I didn't understand that some people were arguing for a particular outcome because they had an economic analysis of the law. The law was about redistribution of property or redistribution of wealth, and that's how they understood what the law was about. And other people had a moral philosophical idea about the law, and they would take a position based on that. So to me, as a first-year law student without any real sort of liberal arts understanding of what these issues were about, I quit because I didn't... I, I really couldn't get my head around what was going on. Now, I don't think that was a very good legal education, but I think the part of what made it not a very good education was that there was no point at which we actually sat down and talked about either historical or philosophical issues so that we could get some context for the issues that we were discussing uh, in law school. I've always had the view since then that uh, it's a misfortune that law schools monopolize teaching in the law. There's very few courses you can take in colleges in the United States on the law because it's considered that you'll learn that when you get to law school, and law schools will tell you what it means to understand the law. But law is part of all of our lives. It's part of our culture. It's a fascinating part of uh, the world that we live in, and it's really a shame that everybody shouldn't have some opportunity to look into it and to talk about it, uh, even if they don't go on to go to law school. And I feel the same is true for these other professional areas as well. So that was what I was trying to get at in that answer. Thank you very much.